verse 1. Now, after every service here at Indian Gap, I've been here at Indian Gap Baptist, I know going on 16 years. Every service from the first service I ever have done here to this service this morning, I'll give an invitation. This invitation is to give you a chance to take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I don't know everybody out there. I don't know your hearts. Only the Lord knows your heart. I don't know if you're saved or not, but I'm up here this morning because I want to see people saved. I want to see people, and if you are saved, I want to be, if you're like me, I want to get better in the Lord. I want to grow in the Lord. I want to have a better walk with Jesus Christ. I want to be able to live that life that the Lord Jesus Christ expects out of me. So when I do finally get to see him, and I can't wait to see him face to face, maybe, just maybe, he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, above all else, I just want to be faithful to the Lord. Just be faithful. You know, I don't have to be good. I'm not good at everything. I'm not good as I could be as a Christian. I'm sure not good as I could be as, as a husband and as a friend to a lot of y'all. But I would love just to be faithful. Just say, hey, you know what? I know he's a sorry, no good dog, but if I whistle, he's going to come running. You know? And that's why I want the Lord to look at me. At least he'll, if I whistle, he'll come running. Now, to get the context of this, we went through, we're preaching, I'm preaching through this, a series of sermons through the book of Revelation. Went through chapter 1, John is on the Isle of Patmos. He sees a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ basically tells him, I want you to write a letter. And I want you to write everything you see. And I want, but I want you first, I want you to write a letter to the seven churches that are in Asia. So he writes a letter to the seven churches. That's Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. And then starting in Revelation chapter 4, John is what we would say raptured out. He's called up. Come up hither. And he as a body, as a type of the cry, of the body of Christ, he's called up into heaven. And he sees some amazing things in Revelation chapter 4. And we went through that. And I preached through that. And one of the things he's seen, he's seen four beasts around the throne. And these four beasts, one, one looked like a lion, one looked like an ox. One beast looked like a man, and one beast had the face of an eagle. Uh, they all had these four faces, and they're around the throne, and they, they uh, all it said, day and night, they said, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So he's seeing, an ama he's seeing a holy God, and he's encountering this holy God. And now it's going to transition into chapter 5, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, that would be God, that sat on the throne, a book. Written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to look loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seas, seals thereof. The Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you humbly, Father, and I pray, Father, you hide me behind the cross, Lord. These people, Father, have come in this morning. They could have been anywhere else, Lord, but they come to they chose to come into your house, Lord, and to worship you, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Father, you would bless them for that. And Lord, I pray, Lord, you would feed us this morning, Lord. Help us to understand your book, Lord. Is there some strange things in here, Lord? Help us to understand it, to comprehend it, Lord, and help us to 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 uh, just to grow in grace and knowledge of your Son Jesus Christ. And I pray in all this in his name, the one that's worthy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, you know who's worthy. It's Jesus Christ. Now, go back up to, uh, go back up to verse 2, and let's break this down. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? So they're looking for someone who's worthy to come take this seven-sealed book. It says written on the inside and the out. And when you see in that word book there, it's like a scroll. It's like a, you take a piece of paper and you just roll it up. And, you, and that's how they'd write on it and roll it a little bit more and write on it and roll a little bit more and they would seal it, seal it. And I'll get into this more when we get further into this chapter. But that's, what, that's why it's written on the inside and the out. And he says in verse 3, And no man, John writes down, And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth. They couldn't find a man in heaven. They couldn't find a man on the earth. They couldn't find a man down in hell. Under the earth. I don't care what any Jehovah's Witness tells you, hell is real and hell is hot. Amen. Hell is real and hell is hot. And a Jehovah's Witness might tell you there is no hell. They don't know their Bible, number one. Number two, they're trying to convince themselves. 
And uh, my, my pastor that was under, Dr. Ruckman, he used to say, if you see somebody trying to take away hell or trying to air condition hell up, that's because that's where they're going. So, I mean, you take that for, <laughs> take that for what, that, what that is. Verse 4, and I wept much. John says he starts crying. Because there's nobody he's found worthy to open this book. Because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. Verse 5, and one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He says there, there was no man that could be found to open this book except for Jesus Christ. Now, notice this. No man. There's no man found worthy. That means, there's, that means Muhammad. That means Buddha. That means Confucius. That means the Pope. That means anybody else you know. No man's worthy but the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the only one that's been found worthy to open up the book. It's a fool, you're a foolish, foolish, having a foolish, foolish idea to think that anybody else is worthy than Jesus Christ. It's a foolish idea to think there's many ways to God. It's a foolish idea to think there's many ways to go to God. When you, have, when you see here in, in, the, in Revelation chapter 5 that there's no man worthy to come close to God. You know, uh, people get mad when you say stuff like that. I've witnessed to people and tried to talk to them about the Lord, and they're like, well, there's many ways to God. You have your way, I have my way. Not what Jesus said. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, this is what Jesus said. Well, you know, I think that's just your interpretation. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You're foolish to try to go another way. Well, pastor, I don't think you should be calling them fools. Jesus called them thieves and robbers. <laughs> You man try to go in any other way, he's a thief and he's a robber. That's what Jesus, I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Don't get mad at me, get mad at what Jesus said if you're going to get mad at anything. But he's got the truth. He said, How do you, why do you believe Jesus over any other man? Because he came up out of a grave. He resurrected. And one of the elders saith unto him, Weep and to me, weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Who's that? That's a Jew. The race of people nobody likes. The only man that can open up this seven sealed book is a Jew. <laughs> the world don't like that. And no matter what the news media tells you, I don't care what the news media tells you, the most persecuted race in history is the Jew. They were killed by more people. They run, I mean, just look at history. Don't take my word for it. Go look at history. You'll see nobody more persecuted than the Jew. You say, why is that, Pastor? Because Satan hates the Jew. Why does he hate the Jews so much? Because Jesus Christ is of the Jews. Behold the lion. He's no longer a lamb. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Look at verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, there's those four beasts I was talking about, in the midst of the elders, there's 24 elders, stood a lamb... As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, which sent forth into all the earth. That's a strange thing he's seeing. So now he sees it transform up by the throne, and he sees this lamb as it had been slain. So he sees a slaughtered lamb. The vision he sees is of a slaughtered lamb, a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns. This lamb has seven horns, and it has seven eyes. Now, the seven horns, seven in the Bible always represents completion. Something is complete. Horns in the Bible always re represents power. So when you see seven horns, what you're seeing is a lamb that has complete power. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And seven eyes. The seven, of course, represents completion. The eyes are going to represent seeing or all-knowing. So Jesus Christ is all-powerful and all-knowing. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Which are, notice, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So the Holy Spirit, just like God manifests himself out in three different ways, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, God, the, the God manifests himself as a, out as a trinity, the Holy Spirit manifests himself out as a, as, as in seven, and you'll find those in Isaiah chapter 11. I already mentioned them 
in my earlier preaching, so I don't want to waste the time to go back through there. But if you're interested, it's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, are the seven different manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And those are represented in those eyes. That's a strange thing. What you're reading here is a very, very, very strange thing. Look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. Look at Zechariah. I'm gonna, we're going to run some verses on this, uh, run some verses up on this set, those seven eyes there you're seeing. See those eyes? We're going to represent, we're going to run a, some references on that. So look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. And I'm going to come down here so I can write on this board here. Zechariah, if, you know, if you're interested in where Zechariah is, Zechariah, if you can find the book of Matthew in your Bible, find the book of Matthew, go to the left. You'll find Malachi, and before Malachi, you'll find the book of Zechariah. Uh, uh, an amazing book of the Bible. Look at Zechariah chapter 3. He mentions in here, he mentions here the seven, the seven eyes. So we'll run some references. And I, if you've noticed as I preach through the book of Revelation, I've had to go to Ezekiel, I've had to go to Daniel, I've had to go to Genesis, Exodus. It all ties together, brothers and sisters. This whole book is one big puzzle that ties together, one big chain that ties together. That's why it's so important not to be taking verses out of it. You're taking any kind of word or verse out of it, you're breaking that chain. Look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. That's a prophecy of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's saying there it's going to have seven eyes. It's, of course, that's what's mentioned there with the Lamb. Remember Jesus Christ, according to Peter, Jesus Christ was a stone of stumbling. He'd be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Jesus Christ is our rock. But he's also a stone of stumbling. And, uh, Peter said, wherefore, uh, in 1 Peter 2, 6, wherefore also it contained in the scripture, behold, this is the Lord speaking. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Time putting your, about putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Peter went on to say he's a stone of stumbling. And notice there that he is uh, there in Je Zechariah 3.9 that that stone has seven eyes. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Explain that, Pastor. I can't really explain it. I'm just showing you that's what the Bible prophesied about Jesus Christ, and you're seeing John's experiencing it there in chapter 5 of Revelation. So those seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. God has a way of manifesting himself out and trying to show you what he's like. We can't, we can't, uh, we can't be around God with, in our flesh right now because he's holy and it would burn us up. Remember, God's a holy, holy, holy God. Remember when he's around the throne, they're not, those beasts that we're, we were looking at, those beasts were not crying love, love, love. Or mercy, mercy, mercy. Or grace, grace, grace. Around the throne of God, they cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They, they want to make, we want to make sure everybody understands day and night that our Lord God is a holy, holy God. Now, I'm kind of continuing where I left off last, last Sunday. I hope, that, I hope this doesn't confuse some of y'all in here that maybe weren't here last Sunday. But last Sunday, they were talking about the beasts. And those beasts... One was of a lion, one was of an ox, looked like an ox, had the face of a man, had the face of an eagle. All four of these beasts, each one had these four faces. And we turned to Ezekiel, and those cherubim in Ezekiel were described as having four faces. And all four faces had, one of them was a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. So, and they were around the throne of God. As, as, as Ezekiel seen God coming towards him, he seen these cherubim, these beasts, and that's what they looked like. One had the face of a lion, an ox, a man, and the eagle. And we went to searching through it, and what we found out is there's four different gospels. And every, four, and every one of these gospels represents Jesus Christ in a different way. In the book of Matthew, the, uh, the gospel of Matthew, represent, Jesus is represented as a king. And it's so strong, and I put in here the genealogy in the gospel. And that, and that genealogy in the gospel of Matthew, it shows Jesus as a king, so it traces his lineage back to him being the right to be the king of the Jews. And for he, therefore, he can take the throne of David in Jerusalem. He has that right. That's what the book of Matthew shows you. What's interesting is the book of Mark shows Jesus primarily as a servant. So when the book of Mark shows up, you read the gospel of Mark, there's no genealogy. There's no virgin birth. It just shows, Jesus just shows up and starts doing miracles. It shows him as a servant. There's no genealogy. A servant has no genealogy. The book of Luke 
Jesus Christ is the Son of Man in the book of Luke. He's prim primarily shown as a man, a son of man, and he's representing mankind. So therefore, when you read the genealogy of, of the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 3, it shows Jesus Christ. It don't trace him just back to David, like Matthew does. The book of Matthew traces him back to David, so you'll know, hey, he's from the Abraham and David. He has a right to be a king. The book of Luke shows it all the way back to Adam. Traces his genealogy all the way back to Adam because he is the son of man, mankind. And then John, of course, is uh, showing the genealogy of Jesus Christ as being the son of God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. That's Jesus Christ as God. So what's interesting about that, those beasts, those four beasts represent the four types of four ways that Jesus Christ is manifested out in the gospel. As a lion, as a king, as an ox, the king of the, uh, the, the, the servant, domesticated animals, there it is. The man, he represents mankind, and of course God in the Bible is represented as an eagle, and he's represented as, a, as God there. It goes even further, guys. Look up at, look up at verse 8. Look at verse 8 of, of Zechariah chapter 3. Hear now, Joshua, Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, this is the Lord talking, for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. So there's a prophecy that God's going to bring forth his servant, and it, look at that capital B in there, all those capital letters. And what is he right there? He said he's going to be a servant, right? Look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3. So there's four different prophecies of God going to bring forth a branch. And if you haven't figured it out yet, you guessed it. They're going to, ma they're going to match all this up. Matthew chapter, uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, pardon me. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. They're going to match up. There's four, there's four prophecies of Jesus Christ as a branch. Look at that in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. And behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David, there it is, the lineage, David, a righteous branch and a king. There we go. There's a prophecy there's going to be a branch. And he's going to be a what? He's not only going to be a king. At first we saw the prophecy was of a servant. Now he's going to be a king. See that? Now turn to Isaiah chapter 4. Turn to the left to Isaiah chapter 4. I'm showing you these prophecies of the branch. And this branch is being prophesied in four different ways. Just like there's four different beasts up in heaven. Around the throne of God. That's what we're looking at. So look at Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. Look at what that one says. I might have just wrote this on the wrong one. Did I write it on the wrong one? Yeah, I did. Look at Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. In that day shall the branch... Of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and commonly for them that are escaped of Israel. Notice that that branch now is prophesied to be of the Lord. See, Jesus Christ is a branch of the Lord. Jesus Christ is, a, is God manifest out for us to see and to walk with. Jesus Christ said, I can only do what the Father does. I can only say what the Father says. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. When you're seeing Jesus Christ through the when you're reading about Jesus through the Gospels, you're reading exactly how God would have done it. You're seeing exactly how God would have said it. That's God. You're seeing Him manifested out, and that branch is of the Lord. Now, let me show you one last one. Go back to Zechariah. I, I'm, I've got a purpose in this, guys. Go back to Zechariah. Zechariah. I got a purpose in this. I'm, I know I'm turning y'all right and left. Four prophecies of the branch. Look at Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. 
The Lord is going to be a branch. There's going to be a branch from the Lord. Now look at Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. So that branch is going to be a man. See that? See that? That's a prophecy right there. Do you see that prophecy in there? Look at this. Verse 12. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man. You know who else said that? Behold the man. Y'all remember who else said that? Pilate said that. Pilate had whipped and beat Jesus Christ half to death. Then they put a crown of thorns on him. And then they put a purple robe. And he brought him out to all the Jews. And he said, Behold the man. And there's Jesus Christ like that, bleeding everywhere, face all puffed up. Behold the man. And they said, Crucify him. <laughs> what, you, will, you, want me, you want me to crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. Behold the man, the branch. So that branch is prophesied in four different ways. And look at how it winds up. As a king, as a servant, as a man, as a Lord God. It goes right back to this. You've got an amazing book in your lap. It's an amazing, amazing book. Look at Zechariah. Look at Zechariah chapter 13. We're going to move on a little bit here. Zechariah chapter 13. Verse 6. Look at Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. You remember what we read in Revelation? What that lamb looked like? You remember what that lamb looked like? That lamb looked like he had been slain, right? This is up in heaven. This isn't on earth. This is up in heaven. Look at, look at the prophecy of Zechariah 13, 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. That's a prophecy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, we're going to be a million years into eternity. We're going to be a million years into eternity. We're going to be have, it's, going to be, it's going to be love and life that we never even imagined before. And we're going to be a million years into eternity, and somebody's going to walk up to Jesus and say, what are those scars in your hands? He's going to say, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Mankind, they build their monuments, they build their buildings, they build their statues, they build their bridges. They, uh, mankind is, can do some amazing things with what God's given us and the wisdom God's given us. But the only thing that's going to be left of mankind a million years in eternity is the scars that we put on the hands of Jesus Christ. You know who put those scars there? Your sin. Because Jesus wouldn't be worthy unless he was slain. Look at verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Jesus directly quoted that verse right there in Matthew. He directly quoted that. When Jesus Christ, of course, was betrayed by, by Judas, our Lord and Savior was betrayed by Judas, then uh, the disciples, the rest of the disciples, they scattered. He was smitten and they scattered. Let's go back to Revelation and close. Let's close back in Revelation. I showed you some of this stuff on the board and what I was doing, and I know some of it kind of be confusing, but what I wanted to show you is that you've got an amazing book that's prophesied of how Jesus Christ is going to come forth and how Jesus Christ is going to present himself to mankind. Guys, if you, don't, if you haven't figured it out yet, this book from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus Christ. Because <laughs> he's the only one that's worthy. That's why I get so stirred up. When, well, there's many ways. We can go through Buddha. We can go through Muhammad. No. Muhammad didn't do anything for you. I was in a high class, a high security prison there in, in Gatesville with, brother, with the brother there. Can't think of his name off the top of my head. Henry. Brother Henry. I was in a high, high security prison there in Gatesville with Brother Henry. And I remember we were walking along. We are going cell to cell to cell to cell to cell. 
And we finally get to the cell, and we're talking to him about Jesus Christ, and we get to this one cell, and the, and the, and the, and the two men in there were Muslims. They said, so we have Muhammad. We don't need Jesus. And Henry, being a lot more grayer than me and being a lot more bolder than me, looked in that cell and said, what did Muhammad ever do for you? And it got really quiet in there. And then he said, he's done a lot for me. Where's your redemption in Muhammad? In other words, you can't get right with God with Muhammad. Muhammad will tell you how you can be merciful. He'll tell you how you can maybe live a better life. So can Confucius. So can Buddha. So can anybody. If you've got any kind of wisdom. But nobody can make you right with God. But one man. And that man is Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn back to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. So we read about this lamb that was slain. And what does he do in verse 7? What does this lamb do in verse 7? And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Notice it's always the right hand. The right hand. The right hand. Jesus said the sheep will go on the right hand and the goats, the ones going to hell, will go on my left hand. All through the Bible, it's always the right hand. The right hand. The right hand. So he takes that book out of the right hand. Notice. Why is it so important? And why is it can only be Jesus Christ? Because you've got to understand, when Jesus Christ is born as a king, as a servant, as a man, and as a God, these last two right here, Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, amen, but He is also the Son of God. He's half man and half God. He's all man. He's born of Adam. He's all God. God manifests out. He's both of those. So he's the only one as a man, because they're looking for a man, verse 3, look. Verse 3, and no man. And look at verse 4, and no man was found worthy. They're looking for a man, and that man's not in this room. That man's never walked on this earth except for one time. That one time was Jesus Christ. He's got to be a man, but it's got to be a man that can go up and take something out of the hand of God. He's got to be the Son of God. Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, can grab your hand, and as the Son of God, can grab God's hand and put us together. The great mediator. The Bible says, only one mediator between man and God. That man is Jesus Christ. He's the Son of Man, and He's the Son of God. He's worthy. Verse 8, And when He had taken the book, the four beasts and the four tw and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. They're worshiping. He's God. They only worship God. What, what are they doing? They're worshiping Him because He is God. He's the Lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. All your prayers are like odors. Guys, when you smell something really pretty, when you smell something beautiful, when you have a, a real good smell, that's, that's a type of a prayer going up to God. Our prayers go up to God as sweet savor, as a sweet smell to Him. Verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? For thou wast slain on the cross and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. Why, why, why is he worthy? Because he was crucified. He was slain and has redeemed us to God. That redeemed is, a, is when you're put in a hawk, you're being bought back. You're being bought back. So Jesus bought us away from the devil. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, the devil owns you. Right. Satan owns you. And you're going to go live with him when you take your last breath. That's where it's reset, because the, hell was never, made for the, was never made for man. It was made for the devil and his angels. But if you allow Jesus Christ through faith, say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to take you as my Lord and Savior. He'll save you and he'll take you and he'll redeem you, buy you back out of hawk. And has redeemed us to God by how? By his death? No. It's by the blood. It's not just the death. It's not, this, it's not enough that Jesus died. It wasn't enough that he was stoned. Because see, if it... Uh, the, the way they put somebody to death in the day of Israel, the way the Jews did it, they stoned them to death. 
There wasn't enough. God, God didn't prophesy for him to be stoned to death. That's why he used the Romans to nail him on a cross. He wanted him to bleed out. Because we're, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Not by our works. Not by baptism. Not by sacraments. Not by any other way. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ. We, read about, we sang about it before church got going. We were singing about it. It's the blood. It's the blood. It's all about the blood. The precious blood of the Lamb. And we're redeemed. I was reading a story about this young man. He had been out in the field and he had caught some sparrows. And he took these sparrows and he put them in a cage. And those sparrows were going wild in a cage. And this older man came by and he seen those sparrows, the, that boy with those sparrows in that cage. He goes, what are you going to do with those birds, young man? He says, well, I guess I'm going to go out and play with them, probably kill them. He said, well, how much would you take for these birds? Said, these birds aren't worth nothing. They're just little sparrows. I found them in the field. He said, yeah, I know that. I know, but how much would you take for them? That young man said, $5. For all of them? Boy, young boy said, yeah, 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 yeah. So he says, I'll give it to you. And he gave the $5 to the young man. And the, the old man took those, that cage full of birds and they're all floating around. And the old man opened up that cage and those birds took off for the sky. And that old man said whenever those birds took off, he could hear them tweeting. It was almost like they were tweet, tweeting, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Free, being bought back by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 10, it has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's your future, brothers and sisters. He's made you kings and priests, and we shall, not right now, but we shall one day reign where? In heaven, on the earth, during the millennial kingdom. And we'll get into that as I preach through the book of Revelation. But that's not what our future holds. Verse 11, and I beheld, and this is John so writing, and I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. And then he said, and thousands and thousands. You can't count that. That's us. What you're reading here, brothers and sisters, is the future. Yeah. You're reading the future, and John's seeing the future, and the church has been raptured out, and we're around the throne, and we're, we're around and seeing all this take place, and we're up at, after the rapture, we're around the throne in heaven as this is taking place, and there's 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands, and we're all around. What do we see? Verse 12, this is what's happening. Saying with a loud voice, let me stop there. It's not going to be a whisper. If you don't like howling, and you don't like shouting, and you don't like people getting excited for Jesus Christ, heaven's not the place for you. Because when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of shouting. There's going to be a lot of hollering. There's gonna be, I'm going to be jumping up and down. I'll be excited I just got there. I can't believe he let me in. I'll be shouting and hollered, and I'll be right here with them, verse 12, and you will be too, saying with a loud verse, voice, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Seven times worthy is our Lamb. Seven times worthy. Those seven blessings put on Jesus Christ. Because He's worthy. Why? Because He redeemed us by His blood. Amen. On the cross, He's worthy because He redeemed us. And it says, of every kindred and tongue and people and nation back in verse 9. It don't matter what color you are. It don't matter where you come from, what your history is, what your background is. If you'll take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll be covered in the blood. And you'll be saved. Verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, down in hell and such as are in the sea, all they and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. That's a fourfold blessing there. Blessing and honor and glory and power. It's a fourfold blessing because it's associated with the church. The number four, I mean associated with the earth. The number of the earth is four. And then closing out in verse 14. 
And the four beasts said, Amen. And so be it. There was a, it was a congressman, I believe it was a congressman, Carver, he's up north, the Democrat congressman. You know what he said in one of the prayers he did in front of the, at the White House? He said, Amen and a woman. That's the leaders of this country. Amen and a woman. Hey, moron, that's not about a man. <laughs> that means so be it. That's just the way it is. That's why when we're singing these hymns and you hear some of us, in, when we're singing, some of us go, Amen. Because we like what we just read and so be it. It's great. We love it. We're giving our approval. Amen. And that's what the four beasts are doing here in verse 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, boy, you're missing out. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you something. If I, if I had Muhammad as a Savior, I wouldn't have nothing to shout about. Oh, he wants me to strap a bomb to myself and blow people up? Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Allah, Allah, bar, boom. They say, you're going to get 70, to, well, you get 70 virgins when you get up to heaven in, in, in Islam. Is that what, how many virgins you get? They, you're going to, they get 70 virgins. Yeah, I'd get up there and they'd be all men. That's what I'd, I'd do. That's, how, that's a joke that'll be played on me. Yeah. And I'm as straight as an arrow, too. If you don't have Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, why not? I just, I just gave you the best biographical sketch of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he's a king. But he's a servant. He'll be willing to get down on his knees and wash your feet. He did in the Gospels. He's a king of kings. He's a lord of lords. He's a servant. He's a man. He knows what you're going through. He's tempted just like you're tempted. But he's, a, he's God. He has the power to get you out of it. He's a power to... Are you in a storm in your life right now? He has the power to calm that storm. He said, be quiet. That's the Lord and Savior I serve. I took Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was 17, and I'm here to tell you that was the best decision I ever made in my life. I've never, I was never, ever, ever, ever disappointed. Like, oh, I shouldn't have took Jesus. As a matter of fact, I thought, man, I wish I'd have lived a cleaner life for Jesus. <laughs> Amen, brother. Lord, I just pray, Father, as we give this invitation, Lord, that if there's somebody in here that doesn't know Jesus Christ, Lord, I know how you feel, Lord, about it. You're not around me right now, Lord. You're not around anybody else who's saved in here, Lord. You're around the lost. You love them, Lord.